namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami This evening is the uh, half moon night, uh, also November the 23rd, uh, 2020. And so the reason for these magnificent Nagas um, embracing the Dhamma seat this evening is uh, we had a ceremony this afternoon to uh, recognize this is 10 years to the day since I uh, was invited to take up the role of uh, abbot here at uh, Amravati. Lumpur Sumato stepped down from that role and formally passed the baton uh, 10 years ago today. And uh, uh, that was um, a, a significant development in, in my life. And uh, so it was also very beautiful to receive people's appreciations this afternoon and many, many cards. Extraordinary creativity, thoughtfulness went into people's uh, cards uh, of well-wishing very uh, very much um, very impressed and very touched by the, the people's uh, gestures of um, gratitude and uh, artistic <laughs> artistic and poetic skills so thank you all very much for that uh, this evening I thought I would talk a bit about the, the last 10 years and make this a bit more of a a sort of personal slash historical um, presentation. So please do forgive me if I spend a lot of time this evening talking about myself uh, or my my own particular sort of story and attitudes and such like. But it feels like it's a a good opportunity to offer some reflections on uh, this last ten years and some of the influences or the. Um, uh, say the uh, informing attitudes and and the spirit that I've tried to bring to this uh, role of leadership here at Amravati in order to uh, be of uh, of service as best I can. So uh, that's what I, I will uh, offer uh, today, and hopefully, hopefully, some of it uh, will be uh, of benefit. Also, I'm aware that to many of the things that I'll talk about, uh, many or uh, most of you have probably heard before in different circumstances, different situations, but I thought I'd put things together a little bit just to make more of a cohesive package on this 10-year uh, anniversary occasion. Reflecting on this uh, earlier today, I uh, uh, recollected that um, the uh, the first time I thought about the idea of, uh, of being abbot of Amravati was back in 1994, and uh, I was living here at that time uh, as a resident here, and um, I uh, happened to be at uh, a sangha gathering in Thailand. We, we were at Wat Ba Nana Chat. And at that time, Lumpur Sumedho had invited Ajahn Viridamo to come. Uh, he'd established the Bodhinyana Rama Monastery in New Zealand, uh, outside of Wellington in New Zealand, and had uh, done a wonderful job of uh, establishing a new monastery there. And Lumpur Sumedho had invited Ajahn Viridamo to come here to England and uh, to take over as abbot at Amravati. So we all happened to be there at Wat Ba Nanacha, the international monastery, at the same time. And so Ajahn V was uh, arriving from New Zealand and just about to so come to Amravati to take up the the mantle uh, of abbotship here. And when we were chatting, uh, at, uh, I hadn't met him for a long time. We'd known each other in the early days of Chithurst and uh, had always been good friends. And so uh, chatting with him uh, uh, at that time, uh, half jokingly, I said, well, and, and he was talking in terms of, of uh, taking up the, the role for for uh, 20 years and i said well if you if after 20 years uh, you need someone to, t to take over then just let me know i might uh, yeah i might be um interested or it might be possible for me to to pick that up you know ha 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 
So uh, that was a um, just a passing comment that uh, I made. But I realized I was joking, but but not joking. Um, uh, and uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, Lumpur Viradamo he served as the abbot here for four or five years, from about ninety late ninety four or uh, to about ninety nine, when the, the temple dedication happened, and then. Uh, he, he stepped down from that and then uh, went to, to go and look after his, his aged mother in Ottawa. And so that, uh, and then spent about nine years in, in Ottawa looking after his his mother till she passed away. And then uh, during that time, then he also established Tisarana Monastery in in Canada. So anyway, um, uh, uh, the 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 twenty year mark would have been two thousand and fourteen, <laughs> but I ended up coming here a, a little bit before that. Uh, as a, as a general rule in in my life uh, for the you know, last many many years, I've tried to make a, a, um, a principle of not asking to to do anything or to go anywhere, but trying to respond only to invitations or encourage you know, people other people's initiatives or ideas or what the world seems to uh, ask for or require. Um, rather than having my own kind of plan or I want to do this or you know, initiative. Um, uh, and so that's generally how I've tried to operate these last 30 or 40 years. And so um, uh, I didn't think any um, after that uh, that informal conversation with uh, Ajahn Viridamo back in 1994, I didn't really seriously think about coming to uh, uh, to live at Amravati again after I'd moved to California. So in, 90, in 1995, uh, Master Hua, the abbot of City of 10,000 Buddhas, donated 120 acres of land that became the, the core of the the, uh, the forest property of Abhayagiri Monastery, and then Abhayagiri Monastery itself opened up a year later in June of 1996. So once I was uh, fully in involved with that, I really didn't think very much about uh, Amravati. It was uh, 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 the, uh, the kind of concern of people over here in England. I would come and visit once a year uh, to come to Sangha meetings, either here or maybe at Chithurst or up at Harnham or down in Devon or uh, one we even had over in uh, Dhammapala in Switzerland. So I wasn't particularly uh, closely involved. I'm not really thinking about uh, life at Amravati or had a particularly uh, close connection uh, during those years. So from about uh, 95 until uh, the end of 2009. So cut a long story short, um, uh, in uh, uh, December of 2009, again, I was at uh, Wat Banana Chat. There were some uh, Sangha meetings going on. And uh, and at the end of the, the Sangha gathering, the International Elders Meeting that had been held at, at Wat Banana Chat that year, then uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, Lumpur Samedi said, Oh, uh, Tan Amro, would you, would you come around my kuti? I've got something I'd like to, to talk with you about. And so, uh, so in my naivety, um, I thought, oh well, he, he, we've we've been on a number of these Dharma adventures together, off to Bhutan or to Japan. We've been to to the Arctic together. You know, maybe it's another uh, sort of Dharma uh, Dharma adventure that we're going to go on. We did, went to Egypt along the Nile and such like. So, oh, I wonder where Lumpur is thinking of next. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> I can be completely clueless at times, so that uh, that was uh, uh, really uh, that was what was on my mind. Oh, well, maybe Lumpur wants to to go to China or to or to Patagonia or uh, the Galapagos Islands or something. Yeah. But, uh, we'll, you know, we'll find out. So I went to his kuti that evening, and um, and uh, and he, uh, he was. Actually, he was actually receiving a massage from a, a Thai man, uh, and, and no one else was there. And the, the Thai man didn't speak any English, and so the conversation was really just between Lumpur and me. And he said, uh, "I'd like you. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come and take over as abbot at Amravati. What do you think about that?" <laughs> so it did take me a moment to um, breathe in, breathe out, and digest that. And, oh, wow! 
And so I felt very, very touched, very honored that uh, Lumpur would uh, think of me for uh, that kind of a role. And I knew that from various comments that he'd made in the previous few years, he'd uh, indicated that he was um, uh, really, uh, uh, say, withdrawing from the community quite a bit and that. Um, was quite uh, quite uh, tired. He was in his mid seventies by then, and just didn't have the the same vitality he felt that he'd had in previous years. And so, I, in a, in a way, I should have put two and two together. But <laughs> as I said, I can be pretty clueless sometimes. But it wasn't until he made that invitation that at that, at that point that uh, uh, I uh, uh, I had sort of received the idea from him and the invitation. So I said, well, I'll have to talk to a few other people, notably Ajahn Pasna, <laughs> my co-abbot and the, the Sangha at Abhayagiri, where I'd been for the previous 13, 14 years. And uh, so on the, uh, the, when I met uh, uh, Lumpur Pasanna the next morning for the arms round, I said, uh, um, Lumpur Samedo uh, <laughs> had a chat with me yesterday evening and uh, invited me to come and take over uh, the, uh, the role of abbot at Amravati. And uh, and so we sort of looked at each other, and, and both of us had the same thought: like, oh, oh well, you know, we were enjoying that. <laughs> it was a, a good partnership that he and I had together, leading a Payagiri monastery um, as a co-abbotship. And so both of us thought, well, it's probably a good thing for for me to come to Amravati. But um, that was a, a sweet and valuable uh, time that we we had had together. So there was a certainly a, a tinge of uh, of uh, sadness at that that uh, uh, so close connection and collaboration between the two of us was going to come to an end. Uh, but you know, all, uh, all good things come to an end, and so that um, seemed to be a a, 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 a kind of natural. Uh, conclusion to that time that we were uh, working together. It had been a, a very fruitful, beneficial time for our, for us as individuals and to help establish that uh, that forest monastery in in Northern California. But it seemed very clear that uh, Lumpo was keen to pass on the role, and so I, uh, and so uh, Ajahn Pasno gave his approval. And then, cut a long story short, again when I got back to. Um, to a Bhayagiri. Uh, quite a few weeks later, uh, amazingly enough, the rumor the rumor mill had not uh, had not brought the rumor to a Bhayagiri until the point that uh, uh, I, I arrived there. Normally, the Sangha grapevine works <laughs> kind of with extreme vigor, and often news travels faster than light speed. But somehow, the the rumor that I was being invited to Amravati hadn't reached uh, a Bhayagiri before I made the. Uh, the, the announcement uh, there uh, after the um, recitation, the, the Patimoka one day. And uh, so the, the Sangha, they were pretty shocked, but they gave their approval. And, and so it turned out that in July of 2010, then I came here, I think it was July 21st, I arrived here. And then Lumpur Sumedho and I overlapped for about four months. And then uh, November 23rd, he stepped down, and I, I stepped up, and he uh, was uh, taken taken off. We, we said farewell to him, uh, took leave of him, and he went off, I think, to the airport that night and, and uh, flew away. And so uh, 10 years have passed since that time. Also reflecting on this, uh, this passage of the last, uh, last decade, the last 10 years, um, I thought it would also be, might be interesting and, and valuable to, to share a few of the principles I had in mind or some of the informing themes that I had in mind when I was invited into this, this role. Uh, and uh, So the, the first thing that um, came into my mind was, was don't try to be Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> You're yeah, not him. Yeah, he's got a very large pair of shoes to fill, uh, and uh, I've been a, a very uh, dedicated and a grateful uh, student, a disciple of his, uh, since uh, uh, the late seventies, where I met him in October of 1979 uh, when I came back from Thailand, and I've been a very, uh, very. Uh, grateful, extraordinarily appreciative of his teaching and his presence, his example uh, in the practice uh, ever since. And so I was 
felt a, a very uh, a warm and deep uh, devotion to him as a teacher. Uh, but I, and also, this is very much his place, uh, and uh, you know, established by him, and uh, sort of informed around his his own um, say uh, ideas and his uh, uh, say initiative, the things that he was inspired to to bring into to being, particularly providing a. Uh, a substantial place for the nuns community to develop, uh, also providing a retreat center where the community could hold retreats for the public and uh, to have uh, Amravati as a, a, a place that could host uh, large-scale teaching events, talks and, and events of various kinds. So it was very much his vision. Um, and I thought, well, you know, he's invited me to, to take over, but uh, I, I, if I try to just replicate him or be like him or imitate him that that <laughs> that won't help anybody it won't help me and it won't help the community and I, i'd learned over time that you know you, uh, in terms of the sangha life even since the, the buddha's era the different elders of the sangha had very very different personalities different characters and my own experience of, of living in, in the sangha has you see that you know, some of uh, the people in the in in the teaching roles are very extrovert, very very colourful, you know, very uh, uh, say um, outspoken. Others are extremely quiet. People have very few words. Some people are very scholarly. You know, there are lots of sutta quotations they'll have in their teachings. Others will just teach completely from their own intuition and not refer to the suttas at all. Um, some are very conservative, some are very liberal, some sort of <laughs> mixtures of, of all those qualities. And so uh, uh, that was a, the first principle I, I felt uh, was important to, to bring to mind was, you know, just just be who you are. Don't try to replicate uh, Lumpur Sumedho, but just uh, be the character you are and just and, and function from uh, from that place. Just speak from that, uh, that kind of... Uh, validity you know just being who you are speak from you you know you're, you're british you know <laughs> you're not an american from seattle you're you're born in in england in kent you know so that this is this is your conditioning and uh you're you're not going to help anyone if you're trying to perform a role that isn't really uh, coming from a place of sincerity and uh and honestly truthfulness the second thing was really uh, a, a uh, following the example that uh, Lumpur Sameda would often refer to when he was invited to come to England by the English Sangha Trust by George Sharp and the and the group in the, in the Hampstead Vihara back in the late seventies and. Uh, uh, he often, and uh, many of you have you know, listened to his teachings and read the Dhamma books, he often refers to this, how uh, when he was, uh, say, preparing to come from Thailand in 1977, a lot of people had uh, ideas about what he should do, what he shouldn't do, and this whole, sort of, uh, say, concept of bringing the Dhamma to the West or the Thai forest tradition coming to, to be established in, in London or, or the, the, you know, the legacy of the English Sangha Trust and have been established by this, this British monk, uh, Venerable Kapilawado, back in, in the 1950s, you know, what was, what was sort of expected by Kapilawado's students. Um, what the, the 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 world needed here in the 1970s, and all the other sort of spiritual movements that have been happening uh, in the in the West, and the, uh, the kind of New Age principles that were were brewing up at that time. So uh, there was quite a lot of <laughs> different uh, ardent thoughts and feelings and opinions were being projected onto uh, to uh, Lumpur Sumato back then. He uh, only had uh, uh, that time. That was 1977. So it was uh, he had t ten reigns as a monk. He was just a, a, a newly uh, newly formed terror, uh, an elder, and so he was uh, not very experienced as a teacher, even uh, uh, in his role of teaching Westerners in Thailand. He'd only been doing that for for two or three years, three or four years. Uh, so coming to the West, he had a, a lot of a different opinions and projections put upon him. And this sort of idea of bringing Dhamma to the West, and you've got to do this and you should do that, and you mustn't be this way, you must be that way. And uh, and then also his own idealism, his own kind of, um, uh, say, uh, his own sort of spiritual aspirations and what uh, he, he uh, uh, would feel that he could do or should do. 
And he had this very strong insight during that time that he's spoken of many, many, uh, many, many occasions that uh, I was quite touched by. He said, amidst all of those opinions and suggestions, he realized, I should just go to England and practice as a monk. And if people want to um, support uh, support me and the other Sangha members there, then they will. If they don't want to, then they won't. <laughs> uh, I'm not going there to spread the Dhamma in the West. I'm not going there to convert the British uh, or the Europeans to, to, to Buddhism. I'm not there to establish the Thai forest tradition. I'm just going there because I've been invited and I'll, uh, uh, and I'll practice as a bhikkhu. That's all I'll do. And that if things develop from that in terms of a growth of a community and the establishment of the teachings, fine. If it doesn't, fine. <laughs> I'll just go, be the, just go and be there, receive uh, what alms food is offered and practice the Dhamma to, to fulfill the life of a, a summoner and, and we'll see what happens from that. And uh, I really took that to heart. That was, that was really, uh, say, uh, I felt significant advice also because it had served him so well, putting aside all of the opinions of others or his own idealism and just taking that core principle of just you know, going there to, uh, to receive the four requisites, arms, food, shelter, you know, uh, robes and, and medicine, and to practice the, the Dhamma as a, as a summoner, as a, a disciple of the Buddha, and then we'll just let the rest take shape from there. Whatever, whatever will come forth from that, we'll, we'll see what happens. So I, I, I took that to heart as a principle to bring to to Amravati when I came. I'm not coming to Amravati to replace uh, Lumpur Sumato or to uh, fulfill, fulfill people's expectations to make everything sort of perfect and wonderful here, and uh, or I had no particular ambitions or plans or our ideas. I thought, well, just I'll just go. And, you know, I've been invited to go to England to be uh, to live at Amravati. I'll just go there and I'll be the senior monk, and we'll see what happens. And that was extraordinarily helpful to have that, um, because uh, again, and probably not to the same extent uh, that uh, Lumpur Sumato had in in the nineteen seventies, because this was much more of a, a an established presence in the you know, in the Western culture and in the Western world and the. Uh, the, the you know way the 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 Dhamma wheel was rolling here already, <laughs> so it wasn't so much from scratch like it was for him in in the 1970s when there hardly anyone even uh, practiced Buddhist meditation, let alone uh, taught it, and, and and Buddhist monastic life was very much a an unknown quality. So you know, uh, coming here in 2010, which is uh, nearly 25 years later. Is a well-established form, but that was extraordinarily helpful advice. Just to come and to receive the four requisites, to practice uh, the Dhamma, and then see how things uh, take shape. Another principle that, again, many of you will have heard me speak about, uh, probably in more informally here and there, is uh, advice that uh, I took from. Um, from the Tao Te Ching, the, the, the teachings of Lao Tzu, the, the, uh, the Book of the Way, the Tao Te Ching. And uh, one of the, the, the verses there says, because uh, a lot of it is about, uh, about the, the Tao Te Ching is a lot about leadership and, uh, and uh, the well-being of a country. And uh, one of the things that is said, one of the verses says, governing a country is like frying a small fish. You ruin it with too much poking. So my apologies to vegetarians and vegans amongst us, but uh, I think the advice holds. <laughs> the governing, a, uh, uh, and so translating that to life at Amravati, so being abbot, being abbot of Amravati is like frying a small fish. You ruin it with too much poking. So uh, and the way I, I read that and took that to heart was saying, don't be a control freak. Don't feel like you've got to control everything or be in charge of everything or know about everything. Uh, and that if something needs um, uh, an adjustment, then be ready to make an adjustment. If it doesn't need, if it doesn't need to be adjusted, if, it doesn't need, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Just leave things alone. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a brief piece of advice, but I've used that so much. <laughs> Kind of on a daily, if not hourly basis, like don't interfere. Let's let people 
let uh, let people have uh, some room to to maneuver. Let people be their own personalities. Let people have their own range of activities and do things in their own way. You don't feel like everything has to be under you know, your personal control. The the abbot is not the uh, a kind of um, dictator or a commander in chief or controlling every aspect of everyone's life but uh, rather um, that uh, I feel that the example of, of say you know Bosomedo and Pocha is you know being at the center being a, a focal point for people but also giving people plenty of space plenty of, of room to to be who they are to find their own way to uh, and their own paths of uh, uh, the, uh, of, of practice that are particularly skillful and beneficial for them. Similarly, on a, on a similar note, the, the, the next thing I, I thought I, I'd like to to um, speak about is delegation. Okay, it's kind of in the same area. Uh, don't feel that you've got to take responsibility or, or, or be in charge of everything, but uh, but uh, be ready to delegate. And uh, again, I took the example from from Lumpur Child and Pusamato being ready to let other people be in charge of things and to say, okay, well, you do it. You know, you you build it. You look you look, you look after this. You run the, that retreat. You know, off you go. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> the first time I was invited to lead a retreat, it was um, Lumpur Sumedho had been going to, to teach every year in Switzerland and running a 10-day retreat there. And uh, he uh, um, uh, had, uh, again, got a little bit uh, uh, sort of burdened with having to do that every year and thought it would be nice if, if this was shared out amongst others. And he asked me if I would go and teach the 10-day retreat in Switzerland. This was in 1986. And, uh, yeah, I never taught a 10-day retreat before, and he was sort of sending, sending me off. And uh, uh, and so uh, I was uh, uh, hoping that he was going to say, you know, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, and <laughs> give me a, a, a lot of close instruction. But uh, basically he just said, okay, off you go. <laughs> and... Uh, and he didn't. And when uh, and when I went there and led the retreat, it was uh, a, a tiny fraction of the number of people who would normally sign up for it had, had signed up. So when he would lead a retreat there, there'd be thirty, forty, fifty people uh, coming to to do the retreat with him. And I think there was about ten <laughs> that signed up for it, and, and most of them didn't stay for the whole time. And so it was a very very small. Uh, uh, and sort of meager uh, I event in many ways, uh, but uh, it was it was kind of wonderful how he when I got back he didn't sort of say okay give me a report how did it go you know what did you talk about <laughs> he wasn't sort of checking up on my accuracy of my dhamma teachings or anything of that nature you know it was a. Uh, it was really wonderful um, to see how, you know, I was extremely green, very, very young in the practice. I was only about six vasa, six reigns, um, so maybe, yeah, six reigns at that time. And um, he didn't have to f control or, or be in charge or, or to check and, and see. And that, that sense of um, respecting my own, uh, say, uh, uh, Capacity, my uh, to let me make my own choices, and particularly to let me make my own mistakes. And, and again, this is very much in the same vein that Lumpur Cha would operate. That he would sometimes somebody would say, "I want to build a kuti," or "I, I you yeah, <laughs> I think we need to have a pond here." And sometimes Lumpur would say, "That's not a <laughs> that's not a good place for a kuti." Or like, you know, if you build a pond there, it's not going to work. But sometimes he'd just say, "Okay." You know, <laughs> carry on, <laughs> and then the the kuti would fall apart, or the you know the pond would remain like a hole in the ground that would never fill up with water. So, okay, so lesson learned. You know, he would let people make their you know take the initiative, but also to learn from their own mistakes. It didn't have to be uh, sort of all according to his plan and his ideas. And so I feel that uh, letting people make their mistakes, delegating, letting people be in charge of, of things to to make their own decisions and take responsibility in different areas. I've, I've tried to uh, really uh, 
uh, follow that that same kind of pattern, that that same example, and so hopefully uh, that's been something that people have appreciated. I'm not being lazy. <laughs> well, I'm not <laughs> intending to be lazy by doing a lot of delegation, but uh, it's really much, uh, very much in this spirit of of giving people a chance to learn their own lessons and to uh, to see where things work well, or where things work badly, and to to learn the lessons from that. Also, from uh, uh, there's a couple of pieces of, of advice that came from Lumpur Cha that I used, have used very actively, and again, many of you all have heard me refer to these. And uh, one uh, one comes from uh, a dialogue that took place between Lumpur Cha uh, and a visitor to Wat Bapong uh, back in the in the late seventies, and this was um, after the the main temple. Um, uh, had uh, I think it had been started and was under construction. Uh, the the Upositor Hall of Wabapong is like a big uh, building project, this very uh, unusual structure that was there. And so this visitor had never been to Wabapong before, and they had been for a, 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 a tour around the monastery grounds and then seeing the, the, the temple building under construction. And then also seeing that there's about 40, uh, 40 kutis, uh, for 40 huts for the, for the monks and novices, uh, anagarikas on the men's side. And there was a similar number, if not more, on the women's side. And, and also being told, oh, and there's, there's, you know, 30, 40, 50 branch monasteries that, that, uh, Lumpur Cha is in Ch uh, also responsible for. So after having this tour and ch chatting with the monk who was taking him around and, and seeing all the, the, the building work that was going on and uh, and hearing the sort of range of, of, of activities and responsibilities that that Lumpur Cha had when he came to to see Lumpur he came so back to the the temple construction site and and in front of the temple there were these um, ancient Sima, the boundary stones that had come from uh, old monasteries that uh, had either been uh, uh, donated or lay, lay supporters had purchased and offered to Lumpur Cha or that had uh, uh, been, say, uh, uh, say, acquired over some time. And so there was a, a, an, a, an array of these ancient Sima stones that were, were placed in the, the front of the, the temple in a kind of garden area. And so uh, when they, the, the person paid respects to Lumpur Cha, I said, yeah, Lumpur, it's amazing. There's so much, uh, so much that you're doing here. You have this whole big construction project going on and you've got you know, 40 or 50 monks and 40 or 50 nuns here and then you know, another 30 or 40 branch monasteries you know, all around the countryside. Yeah, you know, uh, this is uh, this is, must be really stressful. It must be such a, a headache for you and all these people. Uh, and around the, at that time, there was you know, uh, gatherings of people coming to see him and ask for blessings and, and uh, uh, seeing if he could solve their family problems or their business problems or their meditation problems. And and so he said, "Yeah, it's just uh, how on earth do you manage? It must be so burdensome, so stressful, such a headache for you." And Lumpur po pointed over to this large Sima stones, about a meter and a half tall and about, uh, uh, say, 30, 20 or 30 centimeters thick, kind of big, uh, uh, big uh, Sima stone that was standing nearby. And he said, you see that, that, uh, that Sima stone? And he said, yeah, I can see it. He said, do you, you know, do you think it's heavy? He said, yeah, it's huge, it's really heavy. Uh, it's enormous, it's a really big stone. And Lumpur Cha then said, if you don't pick it up, it's not heavy. Ta, my yoke, my nuck. If you don't lift it up, uh, then it's not heavy. And, and then he went on to explain how, with respect to looking after the monastery, having so many disciples and having uh, the, all these different branches, that his attitude was to to not be grasping things, not to be taking a a, a sense of, of ownership. Uh, so I've I've quite, I told that story dozens, if not hundreds, of times in the last ten years. <laughs> but I, I again I take that as a very uh, important principle because it's even with small tasks, it's really easy to make it so personal, so important. It's got to go this way, it can't go that way, and I've got to get it right. If I get it right, that's good, and if I get it wrong, that's bad. And I must I must succeed. I mustn't fail. We make it so personal. We, we, we <laughs> even small things we, we we pick up and we make them really, really heavy. We make the small things into huge things. 
So that's a piece of advice I found you know, very, very helpful uh, you know, over this time. And that, uh, yes, there's a lot to, to do at, at Amaravati. There's a lot a lot going on here. A lot of people, as, you know, right now, six, about 65 people living here, about 45 monastics, about 20 lay people uh, living here. And... Um, the uh, the you know, various different activities uh, going and uh, things going on. We just started doing uh, the experimenting with the doing online retreats. We have these um, building projects uh, sort of on the go. Uh, the nuns' nursing kuti is under construction. The planning for the the sala rebuild is is uh, occupying a lot of attention. There's a lot going on, <laughs> but ta my yoke my nut. If you don't uh, if you don't uh, lift it up if you don't uh, uh, if you don't hold it if you don't grasp it then it's not heavy uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that you don't take responsibility you don't take things seriously but the, the mind doesn't have to personalize everything it doesn't have to frame things in terms of my failure or my success or my project or how I want it to be how I don't want it to be and similarly not just with the, with the projects and activities but in terms of of uh, being with people, living together with people, and working with people's ups and downs, uh, people uh, having difficulties in their practice and uh, struggling with their minds and uh, and their their lives, their health, or people having really uh, beneficial or, or, or you know, wholesome experiences in their practice. How do they? How do people handle uh, their success or things going well, or things uh, taking shape in a in a fortunate way? That if it's not made personal, if it's not personalized, then it's it's so much more spacious. Life is really enjoyable, <laughs> really delightful at, uh, at Amravati. I really, personally, as long as I remember that, I really enjoy it here. So the other uh, as, uh, other teaching of Lumpur Chars that I, I reflect on and refer to a lot uh, is a, a little bit later, from a, a few years after that, in 1981, when uh, Lumpo Sumato went back to, it was uh, a couple of years after Chithurst Monastery had uh, had opened. Um, I think Ajahn Chandasuri went along on that trip. It was, I think, January of 81. And, and uh, she was in an, Agari car at the time, and there was about 20, uh, 20 lay people, 20, 22, 23 lay people went uh, along as well with uh, with Lumpur Sumato. And it was his sort of first trip back to, to, to Thailand after a while. And after Chithurst had opened and Ajahn Chah had been there, when, when Chithurst began in, the, in June of 79. And uh, when he... Uh, uh, Lumpur Sumedho had gone to pay his respects, and, and so Lumpur Chah asked him, so, you know, Sumedho, how's it going there? And he, he went into this, uh, wh how we say in English, he waxed lyrically about how wonderful the community was. Oh, this is, uh, he was so enthusiastic. Oh, it's ex extraordinary. I've never been with such a wonderful group of people. You know, the, we have this uh, uh, small group of very, very committed monks. They're very sincere, very dedicated, and... Um, the uh, the nuns community uh, again the you know small group of people very committed very dedicated very sincere and yes there's such a a, a high quality of focus on dhamma practice and and people um, really you know, energetic and uh, and doing their best to be unselfish and uh, and helpful in into re, you know rebuilding the house and and uh, so doing their um, their very best to, to live in the monastic form in a, in a skillful and beneficial and, uh, and effective way. These kind of I'm, I'm just making all that up, but, it's, but that kind of <laughs> that kind of spirit. And so, after he'd been waxing lyrically, kind of speaking in this enthusiastic and very positive way, Lumpur Chah then responded by saying, ah, "Well, you won't de you won't develop very much wisdom li living with that lot." It's completely unimpressed that uh, there's all-purpose all northeastern Thai sort of grunt from the belly. <sighs> you won't develop very much wisdom living with that lot. And he might have said something like, "I'll send you a couple of difficult people just to you know, keep you uh, keep you on your toes." I, I don't think he said that, but <laughs> I think he was pretty sure that a few difficulties would show up before too long. So again, that. Uh, 
uh, as a story that uh, Lumpur Sumet has told many, many times. And uh, and it's something that I've really taken to heart because when when you are in a difficult situation, uh, somebody's uh, going uh, uh, through a really hard time, they're having a sort of mental health issues, or there's clashes between members of the monks community or in the nuns community. There's people that are struggling and and uh, having a, a lot of challenges in their practice, then it's very easy to think, oh, if only this person wasn't, you know, this monk wasn't arguing with that monk, or, or if only we got this debt paid off, or only, if only uh, these people could, uh, could, could work together more harmoniously, if only that person uh, didn't uh, have that uh, endless ang uh, anxiety about their health, you know, then everything will be fine. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to bother with this? This is a a very natural um, a reactive pattern, certainly within myself. Uh, and, uh, and in years gone by, I would uh, worry a lot. I could easily create a huge amount of anxiety. Oh dear, if only it wasn't this way, everything would be right. If only this problem wasn't here, then I could relax. So this uh, uh, principle that Lumpur Chao was talking about of you know, don't resent the presence of difficult situations. You know, that's how we develop wisdom, is uh, through that friction. And, and again, if you, if you listen to Lumpur Chao's uh, uh, Dhamma talks, uh, we read, it, uh, read the, the, the books of his teachings, it's a principle he speaks of very, very regularly, very often, to, that we, uh, if we are skillful, then we'll take those abrasions, the friction, of life that's where we develop wisdom that's what the you use that friction to sharpen the edge of your wisdom blade that's that's how we we keep our wisdom keen so and that's extraordinarily helpful so whenever i and again it can be several times a day many times a day <laughs> there might be this oh wouldn't it be nice if i didn't have to bother with x y or z and then that principle that uh, lumpur cha was uh, was uh, say expressing in that, so don't don't resent or or, uh, or or sort of shy away from difficulty. This is an interesting challenge. Everything's a test to see what you will do, as Master Hua would would, would put it. Uh, but uh, the uh, the attitude can be turned towards rather than ah, this is a problem that's in my way. To ah, this is an interesting puzzle. Hmm. How are we going to work with this one? This is a, this is curious. This is a, this is interesting. It looks like there's a, the, there's absolutely no way forward <laughs> with this particular person. Aha! Uh -huh. So, so right. Yes, interesting puzzle. I wonder how. I wonder what what, what we'll find uh, with uh, with respect to this. I wonder if there's a way forward that I, I'm not seeing it. There has to be a way. You know, there, as I was saying this afternoon, there's always a way. <laughs> so hmm, I wonder where that way is. So that uh, has been a very valuable principle uh, over over these years that uh, I've used very, very regularly, and so I encourage. And I'm also just not saying all this stuff about how I've worked with the community life just to sort of talk about me, but <laughs> you know, encourage everyone who's, who's here, first the... Uh, here in the temple and so listening in watching from uh, around and and able to to see and hear this this dhamma teaching later on that uh, these are, are really useful principles for living in in the world living with other members of the monastic community living in, the, in with our families in the workplace in society these are all valuable principles Another uh, influence I thought I'd share um, that uh, had a, a big impact on me was actually when I was still a layman and uh, I was um, traveling through Southeast Asia and I'd been on the road uh, for about three months or so. I left England in September of 77 and uh, had a, a free flight to uh, Malaysia to Kuala Lumpur and then had traveled down into Indonesia as far as, as far as Bali and then back up into um, through Java and Sumatra back to Malaysia and then up uh, hitchhiked up through Malaysia into southern Thailand and uh, 
got to Phuket Island. And uh, uh, along the way, um, you know, I, I was just out of university. I was sort of on my, hopefully, uh, or <laughs> ideally on my spiritual quest in, in Asia. Uh, but I spent most of my time hanging out on beaches and sitting in cafes, chatting with other West, young Western travelers um, uh, for a, a large amount of, the, uh, of my, my time. But uh, along the way, I, I had um, one thing I hadn't really been prepared for uh, being in Southeast Asia was the uh, uh, the way that s some people related to to Westerners, and so I had this sense of being, um, uh, say, uh, having to be on my guard. People trying to rip me off or take advantage of me, or uh, uh, and so take. Uh, uh, making me a kind of so sort of ang I was a very anxious person in those days <laughs> making me particularly anxious and guarded and and uh, wary about you know what, what not that I had much money I was on, traveling on an extremely tight budget but um a sense of people wanting to make friends of you because of things they they thought they could get out of you or wanting to have connections or to find a way of, of tra uh, getting to to visit your home country and so there was this uh, this it wasn't the, uh, the entirety of my my experience of traveling through through southeast uh, southeast asia but it had been uh, happening over and over again so what what occurred uh, was uh, and this had, this was the thing that had a particularly profound effect on me was uh, again I was traveling on a very tight budget so I and I'd heard that you could stay in Buddhist monasteries for for nothing <laughs> so, so I'd stayed in a overnight in a in a monastery down in the south in Patalung and then when I got to Phuket I, I found a, a monastery there in Phuket town and asked if I could stay there but, uh, the people didn't um, speak any English. But anyway, the, the, uh, as I uh, got, got into this monastery in the, the kind of compound of this monastery, and some of the the, the young monks there um, some, uh, helped out by going off to to um, find this uh, uh, this fellow who was a, a monastery helper, what they call a dekwat. A dekwat literally means a child of the monastery, but this guy was about fifty or sixty. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but he was from India, uh, Indian ancestry. He was uh, living in Thailand, but he was born in India, and he spoke a bit of English. So he was given the job of looking after this, this sort of uh, this scruffy young Westerner who sh showed up with a little backpack uh, in the in the monastery, asking to stay. And uh, what was most impactful to, to me and has stayed with me all these years, that was more than 40 years ago, was that this fellow was, was just so incredibly kind. You know, he was uh, a monastery helper. He was sort of, uh, he had you know, no, no real um, power in the world, as, uh, as, uh, as one way of putting it. He was sort of... Uh, uh, a very, um, uh, say, humble working class person, and and in the monastery hierarchy, he was sort of way down at the bottom of the uh, of the pecking order, so down below the novices and, and uh, the other monastery residents. But he was so kind, and uh, was uh, so thoughtful. And 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 the thing that really hit me was he didn't want to get anything from me. <laughs> He didn't. He didn't want to to take advantage of me. He didn't want any money. He didn't want to to get an invite to go to England. Uh, uh, he had nothing in his mind or in his manner other than how can I help you? I, I was so wonderful that you come here, and I was just literally sort of scruffy, twenty one year old Westerner with sand in my hair and and uh, you know, dirt under my fingernails. And was pretty, pretty grubby and scruffy. Uh, and yeah, this man treated me like I was some sort of uh, wonderful visiting dignitary, and was so gracious, so kind, so friendly, and wanted absolutely nothing from me, and couldn't do enough to help. And it, uh, and I, it was a, it was an interesting impact because after a sense of having to be guarded and protect myself and not wanting to be taken advantage of, here was this this being who only wanted to help, to serve, to be to be friendly and to provide whatever could be provided. And so, uh, what came into my mind at that time is, ah, there are holy people in the world. <laughs> 
it, uh, it was uh, like meeting a real holy person, someone who's really unselfish, really kind, really friendly. And so that that um, uh, even though that might not seem to be very much to do with abbotship at Amravati, <laughs> uh, and I, I never even learned what his name, uh, or maybe I, I was told he, he told me his name at the time, but it's long since lost to my memory. But uh, he uh, had a big impact on me. That that one evening I spent at that that monastery, that that sense of oh, there is there is goodness in the world. People can be kind, and if you relate to other people with that quality of respectfulness, that graciousness, uh, that that sort of generosity of spirit, that has a very a, direct and powerful effect upon other people. So even though I don't know what his name is, uh, I, I've taken his example of being respectful and, uh, and open and friendly and trying to be helpful as a, a sort of a standard for, for how to relate to other beings, you know, irrespective of, of my role or their role. And that, um, that kind of, uh, of very and uh, perfectly natural uh, and very so sort of beautiful humility that this fellow had uh, that was something that uh, has stayed with me and uh, I, I take as a an informing spirit to how we as human beings can most uh, helpfully relate to each other that we can draw upon that sense of humility respectfulness caring that is that has nothing to do with our, our status or our our place in the hierarchy or in in society just so sort of being to being we can relate in this extraordinarily uh, gentle respectful kind and appreciative way and particularly not trying to get anything from each other like it wasn't like i i want you to be like this for me <laughs> But rather, uh, you know, here we are, uh, here you are, how can I help? And that uh, not trying to get anything, um, not needing anything from from another person, not asking for that, but simply relating on that, uh, uh, that completely opens or being to being uh, uh, and uh, warm, compassionate, friendly basis. As a, I feel, is a, a very um, even even though it was a, someone who, who was not not remotely in the role of a spiritual teacher, I feel that's <laughs> that was a really spiritual teaching and a really good example of how we can function skillfully together as human beings. Maybe the, the last thing to to share in terms of standards that I've used is um, when when I first. Uh, uh, when I first got here, and there was a, a lot of things sort of calling for attention, then uh, it became really clear that the most important thing of Amravati is the people, and that, that there's other things that are called for attention. The um, say the the teaching events that we that we have, the retreats and the talks and such like, the building, uh, you know, looking after the buildings and, and the physical structure of the place. Uh, Dhamma literature, you know, book projects and such like that, that can gather one's attention. But uh, it was really clear to me that, and, I, and many of you, probably most of you, uh, at some point or other, you've heard me say that I always like to make the the uh, the community the number one priority. Everything else comes after that. The you know, the buildings, the books, the the other teaching events that that, that all comes after the well being of the the uh, the resident community that's really the number one concern and i really try to make that uh, a, a fixed principle <laughs> and that uh, other things might call for attention but i, I always try to make the the uh, the the the, uh, the resident community uh, the sangha and the lay uh, long-term lay residents here in particular and lay uh, lay guests who are here that uh, this really is the, the priority because the monastery is the people without the people it's just a collection of <laughs> a buildings on a patch of land in Hertfordshire that's uh, uh, the the monastery is the people it's it's not the it's not the the, the buildings or the programs it's it's us it's the humans Part of that uh, um, consideration was also when when I came here uh, in the 
that summer of 2010, I took the opportunity to sit down with every single member of the community, the the nuns community, the monks community, the lay community, and and spent time, an hour or two, just chatting with everyone, meeting everyone. And uh, that was, uh, I felt, uh, uh, an important step. And, and even though uh, the pandemic has me meant a lot more alienation, and uh, I would, in the normal flow of things, I'd be in the sala every day and available at breakfast time or after the meal time to, to chat to people. We've been a lot more physically distanced, socially distanced during this this year since late March, anyway. So I felt a. Uh, a, a gap there, an absence there, but uh, I do. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that my my priority really is the 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 community here, and everything else uh, uh, definitely takes a second place to that. So uh, over this time, uh, speaking of the things that have gone on, um, it's also uh, again reflecting on the last ten years. Um, one of the things I've been very very happy to be able to do is to. Um, facilitate the ordinations for about 50 people, 10, uh, 10 Sila Tara and 40 bhikkhus during this, this time. So 50 um, people I've helped to uh, bring into the, into the robes, into monastic training and uh, as a, a nun or as a monk. Um, the uh, in terms of the the, the buildings, uh, what <laughs> one of the things that uh, part of the the effect of me not really spending very much time here at Amravati um, during those uh, the years I was the co abbot at, uh, uh, at Abhayagiri was I'd come here for usually about a week at a time and there'd be all kinds of sangha meetings and discussions and catching up with the news and then I'd, I'd go away again. It pretty much uh, any, every visit it was like that apart from the the year when my, my mother died and I was here for a lot longer but so I had this sort of sketchy impression of how things operated in Amravati and when I got here in the summer of 2010 I had naively again <laughs> have a bit of a problem with naivety because I had naively assumed that there was some kind of a plan to replace all the old wooden buildings and that I just hadn't heard about it, but you know, uh, they must have thought about it. They must have thought of doing that. I mean, stands to reason. And then a few weeks after I got here, and I brought that up in conversation, I think with Ajahn Vajiro, who was who was still living here at that time, and he gave me this look and said, "Nope, no plan." <laughs> so at that at that point in that conversation, I think it was about July or August of 2010, I got as far as hmm. Uh, and thought, well, there's, there's plenty, there's plenty going on here already. Um, but then, by the time I got to 2011, and uh, I saw the, uh, the the heating bills and the the, the cost of maintenance for the, the old the, these old wooden structures, uh, then uh, I began and saw that they were they were um, uh, 70 years old. They're now 80 years old now. Uh, but okay, well, I guess I have to think about a rebuilding program. <laughs> So that uh, uh, that, but that also that uh, al along with the uh, fifty new monastics that have come in under my uh, my uh, my time here, then uh, we've put up uh, let's see the three three new buildings: the Aroga Kuti, the Amara Kuti, the Samagi Hall, and then the Nuns Nursing Kuti is in process, and we have the plans to uh, replace the uh, the sala, all taking shape. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, also, I just again thinking about these last ten years, I, I, I totted up how many books I've either written or helped to edit, and it's a bit shocking because it's about twenty in the last ten years that I've um, either written or helped to edit or, or, or look after. So that's a, a bit shocking. <laughs> But I am a wordy person, so it's not entirely surprising. But it is about it's, it's twenty or so that uh, I've either edited or, or written or, or had a hand in producing. So, which is also it's, it's good to see the dhamma materials being available. But it's also kind of shocking <laughs> that uh, to to see, to see the the, the sort of sheer amount of, of that. So this uh, uh, this night ten years ago, uh, one of the things that was really um, 
quite amazing and touching was that after Lumpur Sumedha sort of got in the vehicle and was uh, driven out of the gate, uh, that even though it was the 23rd of November, there was a huge snowfall that night. There was a, and there's, we took uh, some photographs, there was a big blanket of snow just sort of fell on the monastery. It was a really quite touching. Well, you know, I, I have no p direct knowledge of what the devas are up to, but it did feel like the devas were uh, marking the, the departure of Lumpur with this, whoosh, this white blanket that covered everything like a... Yeah, uh, an Anagarika's robe, kind of boom. <laughs> the whole uh, the whole place was uh, was transformed overnight, and then also the the silence that comes with the thick snowfall. There was this sort of um, this kind of mark upon the the, the landscape and that, that change. So ten years have gone by since then, and uh, again today, when I was reflecting on this, I thought, so what was it like the next morning after Lumpur had gone and my my first day as the abbot? What, uh, what what happened that morning, or what, what did we do that day? And then bringing my mind back to that, that felt like a hundred years ago. <laughs> but it, it also felt like last week, so that, I thought that's, that's really strange. How, how can it be last week and a hundred years ago at the same time? But yeah, there's, there were those kind of perceptions. It seems so long ago and so much has happened since then, but it was just, just last week. Uh, and the... So I was, I was looking at that and, and recollecting that, and uh, and a, a phrase of Lumpur Sumedho's came to mind. That uh, uh, he said, uh, in one of his Dhamma talks, he said, "Time is an illusion caused by ignorance. Time is in an illusion caused by ignorance." And that was a, a really good instance of that. Like, so was it last week? Was it a hundred years ago? Well, what <laughs> what what is time really? And uh, and so maybe the the last thing to share this evening, I thought, re, you know, reflecting on, on time, this being a, a ten year mark, uh, uh, one of the the saraniya dhammas, the the causes of well being in the sangha, the causes of of, uh, of harmony and well being in the community. The number six on the list is uh, to maintain in being the insight which is noble and liberating. And so one of the those insights, or that the insight which I, I feel is is noble and liberating, and also has served me extremely well during this uh, this last ten years, is um, the insight into time, the nature of time, and particularly Lumpur Cha's comment that uh, a summoner has no future. You know, one who is a, a spiritual seeker has no future. So in our worldly way of thinking, we have a past, we have a future, we've got plans, we've got things that we, we want to do, the things that we're responsible for, the things we're, we're, we're stressed by, that we've got to do, and expected that we're expected to do. Uh, but this little comment of Lumpur Chahs, you know, a summoner has no future. So what that means to me is that if the heart is really uh, attuned to Dhamma, if there is a recognition of the akaliko, the timeless quality of the Dhamma, the sanditiko, apparent here and now, akaliko, timeless. If the heart is really attuned to that fundamental uh, quality of its own nature, if the heart is embodying Dhamma, if the heart is awake to the fact that its nature is Dhamma, the citta is Dhamma, it's not a person, when the, when the heart awakens to its own fundamental nature as Dhamma, then that uh, is uh, the, the very quality of timelessness. The heart is free of the limitations of time. There is no future. <laughs> we, and so to the, to the worldly mind, no future is a disaster. It's depressing. It's, a, it's, ni it's nihilistic. But uh, to the summoner, it's like, well, of course we have no future. <laughs> Dhamma is a kaliko, it's timeless. And, uh, and so uh, in terms of uh, uh, so both uh, the element of, of uh, insight in the practice, developing an insight that's noble and liberating, the more that we can recollect a, a summoner to, to, uh, to bring our life, this life with these human forms and these personalities, into alignment with that principle of timelessness, we let go of the future, let go of the past, let go of the present. No yesterday, no tomorrow, no today. 
then there is that quality of, of harmony, there's the integration, there is the saraniya, the, that which conduces to the, the beautiful, the wholesome, the, the noble. Doesn't mean our list of things to do magically evaporates, <laughs> but in that moment, there is no time. There is this, the, the timeless Dhamma. There is not a me passing from a past into a future through this present, but there is this, there is the, the, the Dhamma here and now. And that when there is that attunement, then, uh, and that letting go of, of the, uh, the, the habits of thinking in terms of past and future, of birth and death, then there's a great freedom, there's a great ease, and that also is one of the, the insights that really uh, helps our life in, in this uh, living situation the, the, to fulfill the intentions of the monastic life, uh, to let go of that sense of me uh, of a certain age, me passing through time, me with a yesterday and a tomorrow, but rather letting go of self, letting go of time, letting go of location, and then the heart awakening to its own nature as Dhamma. This is how the uh, the potential of these lives is is most completely fulfilled. And so that uh, uh, the the challenge is to recollect that, to not let the mind be drawn into those pasts and futures, and instead to to take those daily recollections, sanditiko akaliko ehipasiko, apparent here and now, timeless. It's not just a a spiritual idea that's the fabric of this reality that 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 we are and uh, when that is actualized when that is embodied and that, that is realized moment by moment then uh, we are truly being a summoner that is the embodiment of the summoner principle is that uh, that that very quality no past no future no present no uh, no uh, no self no other this, uh, there's simply the, the Dhamma of the present moment. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening. <laughs>